What, what don't you know? Well, <laughs> what, did, what makes you angry that you don't know or that you're wrestling with it? Oh, there's a thousand things. I, I've often said to students, and indeed in pastoral work, the reward for getting one answer is you get three more questions. You know, that's why life goes on being exciting. You think, hey, you know, I just found that, but then this leads me into a different room. I didn't know this room existed, and now, now where do we go? One of the things that I think our generation finds it very difficult to understand is the notion of sacrifice that the Old Testament is full of sacrifices and Jesus and the, uh, the apostles use the language of sacrifice in relation to Jesus' own death. Now, obviously, we do not, as a matter of habit, ritual, custom, um, slit the throat of goats or bulls or calves or doves or anything else in the way that people used to very cheerfully I'm right across Texas the edge. We still do that. You still do that. Oh, that's, that's all right. Then fine. Okay. Well, you can tell me afterwards what it means. But you see, my fear is that a lot of Christians, when they think sacrifice, they, they um, collapse the notion of sacrifice into some version of penal substitutionary atonement. Now, as my books make it quite clear, I believe in penal substitutionary atonement, just in case there's any doubt on that score. Let's watch my lips, Galatians 3.13, Romans 8.3 and 4, etc. Um, Paul says that um, God condemned sin in the flesh of Jesus Christ. That is penal because it's condemnation. It is substitutionary because what happened there in the flesh of Jesus Christ means that therefore there is now no condemnation for those. So I mean, Romans 8, 1 to 4 really says it all. And there are lots of other passages too, of course. But I don't think that's what sacrifice is about. Sacrifice means a wide variety of different things in the Old Testament. And there's sin offerings and guilt offerings and thank offerings and so on. And the idea that all sacrifices have to be collapsed into the idea that uh, God wants to punish me, but I transfer the punishment to the sacrifice and the sacrifice gets killed instead of me. You do get that a little bit on the Day of Atonement, but I notice that when the sins are confessed over the head of one particular goat, that is the goat that isn't killed. That's the goat that's driven off into the wilderness because the sin has made it unclean. So there's a real problem about this. And, and I, I get frustrated with the thought that a lot of Christians, when they think sacrifice, they either ignore it altogether or they think, oh, yes, that's that atonement stuff which we learned about in Sunday school. I don't think that either of those really works. And I suspect we need to do more studies of the kind of whole social and anthropological context of what people thought they were doing when they were offering sacrifice. And I've tried, I've asked Jewish friends, Jewish scholars, why did the ancient Israelites do this? And the only answer I usually get is because it said so in the Torah, so they had to do it. And I'm not satisfied with that. I think people had a deep instinct. It's something to do with humans and animals and God and land and so on. It's a, it's a kind of a a ritual way of expressing the place of humans that that we do not take flocks and herds for granted. We are not simply building up our own wealth, which was, of course, animal wealth in the ancient world. Animals and land were, were wealth, basically. Um, so you give the first and the best to God as a sign that it's all from him in the first place and you're not just being greedy. But that's only a little pointer towards something which is right in the middle there somewhere. And uh, I'd love to see some more serious work done on that.